Hello everyone, welcome to my next installment of my video series for Psychotic Break, my new Beetleweight build. This video is going to be all about belts. I'm going to talk about different belt types, why you'd use a belt, and I also have this beautiful little jig that I came up with that I'm going to be using to break belts and test how much force it took to actually break the belt. So let's talk about belts. Some of you may or may not know that I don't really do any kind of script or outline for any of my videos. I just kind of stand in front of the camera and go, and I kind of have a vague or loose idea of what I'm going to be talking about. This video is definitely no different. The only thing I really have planned for this video is I want to use this thing to break some belts. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. I've got my um, secondary camera over here, which does high speed. I think I can do uh, 1,000 frames a second, so maybe a 40th um, slow motion. And then uh, maybe I just want to talk about different belt profiles. I've got all sorts of belts here, anything from a really tiny little timing belt to an O-ring belt. I've got a um, J-style serpentine belt, and I think I have a V-belt somewhere in here as well. So, I don't know, let's start by talking about different belt types and why you might want to use a belt in your design. So why would you want to even use a belt in the first place? For all my previous ants and beetles, I have never used a belt to drive the weapon, and I've always done a weapon, but I've always done direct drive. And direct drive means that the weapon itself is directly connected into the weapon uh, blade or whatever it is, disc, you know, whatever. They're directly coupled and there is no belt or transfer of power be by other, any other means other than just direct connection. I am going to be using a belt in this design for the sole purpose of removing the motor from the actual weapon, you know, relocating it somewhere else. So that is one very valid reason for using a belt or a chain, I guess, if you want to do, is just to simply make the motor in a different location than where the actual weapon is. And in the case of psychotic break, I only have so much vertical room in that front center hub and you know, it might get hit or something like that, so relocating the motor somewhere else is going to be desirable. The other main reason that you would want to use a belt is to use it as some sort of clutch mechanism. So the weapon is spinning around like this and then something comes into contact with it, which of course is going to happen, and that weapon is going to slow down or stop or something of that nature, and that energy kind of needs to go somewhere. Hopefully it all goes into your opponent, but it's also going to go back somewhere into you. In a perfect scenario of, you know, perfectly flat, spinning around like that, and it just stops, that energy could get transferred back through that um, belt back into the motor. If you were direct drive, meaning the two are coupled, you could shatter the magnets on the motor or something like that. If you have a belt in between the two, this can um, help to take up some of that slack. It can slip along the pulley, just causing it to maybe smoke a little bit because it's just, you know, sliding along the pulley. Um, they can also stretch a little bit in the instance of an O-ring or round belt pulley. These things are really stretchy, so that stretchiness could absorb some of that impact. It's a good way to act as a clutch or act as um, some kind of um, buffer in between the weapon and the motor. So that's another good reason that you would want to use a belt. Another reason that using a belt could be a good idea is to um, take advantage of mechanical advantage, if that's the right way to say that. If you direct drive a weapon, meaning putting the weapon directly on the motor, you are not going to be able to gear it any differently than it is. If you have a KV rating of 100 on the motor, whatever voltage you put into this is directly going to be proportional to what the weapon is. So a 100 KV motor at 10 volts, let's say, is going to be 1,000 RPM. Your weapon is always going to be spinning at 1,000 RPM. There's no way you can change that. However, with a belt, you introduce the idea of a pulley, which the pulley is the thing that transfers the um, power from the belt, from the motor to the weapon. You can do a 2 to 1 ratio. You can do a 1.1 to 1 ratio. You can choose pretty much any ratio that will mechanically be allowed by your design, and so then you can leverage that with the belt. So in my case, I want to slow down the weapon a little bit. It is so long 
that um, I think if I was direct driving, I'd be at like 350 miles an hour, which is really crazy fast. So I'm doing like a 1.125 to one is gonna be my final ratio probably. And that will drop it down to I think 250 miles an hour or something like that. So being able to slow down that weapon and also increase the startup torque, things like that, um, is another good idea for using a belt. In front of me, I have a lot of different types of belts, and uh, I wanna go through and just kind of explain the different types, maybe introduce you to some of the terminology and give you an idea why you'd maybe wanna use one, why you wouldn't wanna use the other. And then after this, I can talk about how to kind of size your belts for the application, and then we'll um, start breaking some of these. So uh, let's first start with uh, timing belts. This right here is a timing belt. Um, I picked this one out because it's uh, much bigger so it's easier to see on camera. Timing belts go along with timing pulleys. This is a timing pulley. And you see it has these little um, nubs or grooves, doesn't really matter, and it corresponds to this. These two don't actually go together. I just grabbed these out of my parts bins. Um, but these little nubs on the belt correspond to the nubs on the pulley. And what timing belts are good for is transferring motion from one thing to another, uh, I guess consistently. These are used a lot in CNC machines, um, precision motion control stuff. When you move the pulley, it's going to move the belt and move the other thing on the other side in a predictable manner. The belt is not going to slip. The belt fits inside these little grooves and it transfers in much the way that a chain would. However, the big difference with a timing belt over a chain is that there's no real slop here. It doesn't really move around a lot, um, so you can get very precise control. That's why I say that they can be used for CNC machines because it's not gonna slip around. And traditionally, these belts have absolutely no flex whatsoever. The other nice thing about a timing belt is that they are very flexible. You can see that we can squish this thing all the way down and um, you can go around very small radiuses and you can curve it around a lot. It is a very flexible belt for the size. Now, if you're gonna be using a timing belt with timing pulleys for transfer uh, for a combat robot, you gotta keep in mind that this really doesn't solve the problem of acting as a clutch or um, I guess as a uh, spring or a buffer because they are going to be connected. So if you are moving it around like this and the weapon stops, it's gonna transfer all of that back into the pulley. Don't expect this to stretch or take up any of that slack or really slip at all. Um, so that is really a timing belt and timing pulley. Timing belts come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. This is a really, really itty bitty tiny one. This is um, actually what I'm thinking about using for psychotic break. Don't let the size fool you. And um, really it is going to be based on the width, the overall length or diameter, and then the pitch of the um, actual little grooves or bumps here. And that's really how you spec a timing belt. They usually have a name, like I think this is a 2MXL or something like that. It doesn't really matter. On to say, yeah, this is a power grip. Yeah, MXL profile. So really it's the profile of this belt. That's how you pick a timing belt and then you match it to the pulley. Now what some people do and what I'm gonna be doing is using a timing belt for all those great benefits of not stretching and also for um, just being really flexible, you can use it with a smooth bore pulley and um, basically these little nubs just kind of um, press against a smooth bore and you can transmit power that way. But that is pretty much all you need to know about timing belts and timing pulleys. Let's talk about O-ring belts or round belts. Round belts are very much what you would think. They are round and um, they look a lot like an O-ring. This is a really long one right here. These belts are very, very flexible. Um, as you can see, you can just kind of bundle them up all nice and tight and they spring back. They're also extremely stretchy. I don't know how I can see that on camera, but they're um, extremely stretchy and they have a lot of give to it. Now, as you can imagine, this could be good for certain applications and bad for other applications. If I had this around two pulleys and that weapon stops, it could actually do something like that to where it creates a lot of slack on one side and then this could jump off of your pulley. So be very careful using round belts or O-ring belts. In most other applications, you want to size the belt so that it fits um, kind of tight in there and then you have maybe something to take up that slack. With an O-ring belt, you really want to stretch it so that it can't jump off of um, 
jump off of the pulley or jump out of the track because if you left it just kind of tight like that, it could stretch out and then jump off of that pulley and then you have a real issue. Uh, O-ring belts are very easy to get. Um, the other nice thing about these is you can slice them and actually use a little super glue and rejoin them. I have found that super glue is extremely strong for um, rejoining these belts. Um, so it's kind of good for drive in small bots and they're really easy to find. And of course the profile is very easy because it's just you know, a half round. So yeah, that is um, O-ring or round belt pulleys. V-belt pulleys. Uh, V-belt pulleys are very common. You probably might be familiar with these from like drill presses or machinery. It is a very, very common um, type of belt and it's called a V-belt because this profile is just kind of like a V. So, you know, the uh, pulley profile looks something like that. The belt fits down inside that profile and you are good to go. This is a relatively small belt. And even though it looks flexible, this is the least flexible of all the belts I'm going to be talking about today. I originally was going to use this in crippling depression, my 30 pounder, but it has to fit around some kind of weird profile like that. And the size of the belt that needed to be in that bot it was just not flexible enough. It added a lot of friction because these don't necessarily like to go around tight spaces because it has a pretty thick cross section. They are very cheap. They're very easy to find. They're very common. This is gonna be the simplest belt, but it is also quite heavy, quite bulky, and um, not that flexible, so yeah. Moving on to the last and final and my most favorite of all belt types is the serpentine or J style belts. Um, these are interesting because they're like a mini V belt that's stacked up. I don't know how well that's gonna show up on camera, but you can see it has multiple grooves along here. And it's really these tiny miniature V belts that is one, two, three, four connected together. So the way that you buy these belts is you actually buy it based on the profile or the size of one belt. And then it tells you how many grooves there are. So this is actually, um, I don't know, this is a 2000J um, poly V belt, whatever. Um, but you actually buy it on the cross section. I think this is like 0.15 or something like that is the size of one. And then it's a four section. So you can get this in six section, eight section, 12 section, and bigger and bigger. This is, I think this might actually be one of the belts from Crippling Depression. And I use this instead of the V belt that I showed previously because it is just so much more flexible than the V belt and it doesn't have this really deep profile. It transfers about the same amount of power but it is significantly thinner and because it has these V's or these uh, multiple sections in it, that's actually the grooving is the friction that you're using to transfer that power. So you get a lot more friction in those grooves in a much smaller surface area than just the um, two sidewalls of the V-belt, if that at all makes sense. The other fun trick about a J-style V-belt is you can cut them in half and get two smaller belts. So here I've just taken one of these, slid it down the middle with a straight edge or a straight razor, and now I have a two section. So I've got a um, little two V-belt pulley. I could actually slip this down further and make a single belt. So you could buy one of these four section belts, cut them down the grooves and make four belts out of this. So if you're looking for a mini V-belt like that, you can actually use a J style belt or a serpent serpentine style belt, cut it up and make your own belt out of it, which is kind of cool. And since you can get this in like eight and 12 section belts, you, you could get a lot more bang for your buck if that's something that you're concerned with, but it makes it nice to fit the size that you need. For what I'm doing, I need a belt that is less than a quarter inch wide. So using one or two of these sections works out quite well when there might not be as many other options in other belt types. So that is a J style or serpentine style belt. Are we having fun yet? I know I'm having a blast with this. Uh, next up, let's talk about how to size your belt. So this is actually pretty easy. I think a lot of people overthink this. Um, first up, there's a ton of calculators online that you can figure this out if you're doing something complicated or weird, um, but I can give you the kind of quick idea just so you can 
think about it in your head a little bit. Uh, check below in the description for the calculators that I like and I use. Um, also for finding belts, McMaster car, finger tech, just go there. If you can't find it at either one of those places, eh, maybe your design's a little bit too complicated and you need to think a different way. So let's say we have a pulley on one side and a pulley on the other side. And then of course we have our belt in between the two. Really all you need to do is take the circumference of one pulley, divide it by half, circumference of your other pulley, divide it in half, and the distance between the two centers by two. Think about it this way. Your belt is gonna be wrapped around like this, so what is the whole circumference of this belt? Well, it is gonna be from here to here, or the center of this pulley to the center of that pulley, times two, because we have the top and the bottom, and then it's gonna be half of the circumference, the circumference being the whole way around the outside of the pulley. So you're gonna have half the circumference, half of the circumference, and then the distance between those two centers. Now granted, if you have a really big pulley and a really small pulley, it's not necessarily gonna be the distance because it's gonna come down like that, but this is a rough way of gauging just that size. For most of us in this application, we're not gonna have two drastically different sized pulleys. But here's my point, is if you're just trying to figure out like, oh, what kind of size pulley am I gonna be using? Am I gonna be using something this big or am I gonna be using something this big? And you're just trying to get a rough idea, half of the circumference of one, half the circumference of the other, and two times the distance between them is a really easy way to guesstimate. All right, so ultimately this video is really in the psychotic break video series, and I'm trying to figure out if this belt is going to be strong enough to drive the weapon for psychotic break. Uh, I have this really, really small and really thin timing belt. This is kind of what I want to use for size, for weight, and a few other reasons, just for flexibility. So what I want to do with this jig is figure out how strong this belt really is. How much force does it take to snap this belt? And how much deflection is there in the belt when I start to stretch it? So here is my little setup. I've got a uh, two by six, I guess. Um, I have this um, really strong metal picture frame hook on this side. The belt is wrapped around. It goes into one of these load cell things. These are cool. They're like hanging scales. I think you can find um, that's what they're called on Amazon. It has a nice metal body and it's 110 pounds max. I might max this out. And then it has a little thing there. I 3D printed this up top. This is nylon G, um, which is glass fiber filled uh, nylon. And as I tighten this screw, it will tighten the belt and then we can record how much stress or strain there is on the belt. Now, fun fact about this piece over here, I originally had this um, steel angle bracket over there instead and this thing would literally just crush down like i can't even bend it at all in my hand but this thing would just fold and buckle in my initial test so let's see if the 3d printed part is stronger and let's see uh, what fails here so i'm probably going to start with the smallest belt so let me get that set up let me get my um, high speed camera over there set up and let's see if we can break something I, I'm not good at recording with the high speed, so I already screwed that up. So let's act like that never happened. Okay, let's um, test the first belt. Uh, so I have this on, I've got it teared out to zero. I've got a lot of slack in there. And all I have to do is just kind of screw this down and increase the tension. Now, as soon as this snaps, I gotta go over to the high speed camera and stop it. And it records like the last five seconds in high speed. So I need to remember to do that. So 15, it's 30, okay, 40, 46, we're getting like no stretch here whatsoever, 50, whoa, 56, and the camera turned off, awesome. <sighs> So some things don't always go the way that you wanted. I had this um, grand idea of testing all these belts and writing it down and presenting some chart or graph or something like that. Didn't really work out that way. None of these belts broke. Uh, the only ones that broke were the really small ones and I only got one little section of high speed footage and it's not very interesting. Um, here it is. 
it's not terribly interesting. It doesn't really tell me anything. It just simply snaps. That's about it. Um, yeah, so that's all there is to that. It does break along the sharp point on the attachment on the other side, which I figured. I figured that's where it's going to break. It's not just going to randomly break in the middle. It's going to break on a stress point. Uh, so that, you know, isn't very interesting. The reason I didn't round that off or not make that a stress point is because, you know, in combat robots, that's kind of where things are going to break. So eh, I figured it was a good indication of reality. So um, these small ones were the only ones that broke, and that is not too surprising. I was kind of thinking maybe some of these other belts would actually break, maybe just at a different um, load rating, but they did not. It exceeded the 100, 110 pounds, and just nothing really happened. The good thing that I learned about this is of these small timing belts, there was two different versions I ordered from McMaster Car, and they broke at different ratings, um, different strengths. The smallest one was like 51 to 57 pounds, I think, was where it broke. And the other one was around 85 to 87, so significantly more. And 50, I don't really feel terribly comfortable with, but in the 80s, that's a good amount of force. I feel okay with that. So I think I'm going to still kind of go forward with these. They are pretty strong, and I don't like the bulk of some of these other belts, so we'll see. I think I'm just going to go forward with these, and if they don't work out in testing, I have these other belts that I can fall back on. But I do apologize for um, that not being as interesting as I was hoping it would be. I was really hoping it would be kind of interesting to see the um, different profiles of belts, but Oh well, you never know how these videos are going to go. So next step in psychotic break, I'm really not sure. I have the whole structure, I have the whole frame. I need to reprint the pulleys or maybe make them out of aluminum so I can do better weapon testing. Right now they can't really drive the wood weapon um, because they're slipping and then the PLA is melting. So I need to print those out of a different material. Now that I kind of know that these belts might sort of work, um, or at least I know the reinforced one is going to work, I'm going to go down that path. And I also have the uh, wheels in, so I might hook some drive motors in and just kind of go start going that uh, route. This is the point in the project where I'm never really sure where to go next. I The weights are good. The weapon seems good. I kind of have a belt that's going to work. It's always difficult to just kind of pull that trigger to just take it to the next level and just start fabricating parts, at least for me. So. We'll see what those next steps are going to look like. So I don't really know what the next video is going to be. So I guess stay tuned. Um, thanks for sticking with it. Uh, this probably wasn't my best video ever, but oh well, uh, such as life. As always, you can check out uh, more updates about my channel on Facebook. There are a bunch of links down below. Just go ahead and click on all those and see what that's all about. And um, as always, thanks for watching. See you next time.